So hello uh, everybody, hello again maybe, or hello uh, for the first time. Welcome to in this live streaming uh, of uh, Innovate Supply Chain event. So uh, we've been here uh, live since uh, 9.30, so uh, practically uh, half a day now. Uh, we have uh, interesting uh, presentations uh, from Unilever, from startups, from cool vendors. Uh, and now we're going to have a presentation by uh, Professor Janet Gottsell uh, from the University of Warwick. Um, great lady, very uh, knowledgeable, and she has done excellent uh, presentations and excellent uh, uh, surveys. So um, it's good to, s to see that uh, there are good surveys uh, being done and uh, with practical uh, insights. So uh, Janet, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good afternoon, Martin. So, uh, no, uh, hello everybody, hello to the world. Uh, good news is we already have uh, received 389 votes for the four startups. So uh, the votes uh, have been done perfectly. So uh, a lot of viewers and uh, still a lot of viewers, new ones, uh, already from uh, the previous session. So uh, I would say to you, uh, Janet, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Martin said, I'm Jan Gottel. I'm Professor of Operations and Supply Chain Strategy at WMG, the University of Warwick. And over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to share some insights with you around supply chain visibility and resilience. And what we're going to be looking at is what is potentially the new normal. So many of you who attended Innovate last year saw the excellent keynote by Sean Cully, who um, identified that we're actually at a transition point. Now, many of you think that transition point is potentially the transition point into the fourth industrial revolution, powered by the internet. And um, essentially what Sean was identifying last year is that at these transition points, they're the real opportunities to be innovative and to actually be very creative and think about how we would enter what he described as our sixth wave of creative destruction. However, a lot has changed since then. Um, just last week, there was a really interesting article on the BBC News by um, Sir David Attenborough, and actually what Sir David was talking about was the need for us to curb excess capitalism to save nature. Because although I think many may have thought that the next stage of our industrial evolution or revolution is one that's powered by the internet, fundamentally there's a slightly different way of looking at this. And as Sir David said, you know, as we look to the future, perhaps we're going to have to live more economically than we do, because actually um, in doing so, we could live more happily, not less happily, because some of those excesses of the capitalist system um, are actually now being outweighed by the environmental and social impact. So we might need to actually think of a slightly different model. And so perhaps as we enter this next stage of our economic um, development, whereas the previous industrial revolutions have been um, consumption driven economic growth, as we enter this next wave, perhaps the real challenge isn't just one of the Internet of Things, isn't just one about Industry 4, but really is a challenge of how we actually get a better balance between um, economic growth and the way we balance that with environmental and social impact. And actually, for many of you, I know that many organisations now put the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals at the front. The one that particularly re resonates with myself is um, global goal number 12, which is about responsible consumption and production. Because fundamentally, um, consumption driven economic growth is driven by our role as consumers and our desire to buy more and more and more. Rather, and this has led to us developing things that are cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and can't necessarily be repaired or renewed. And fundamentally, this means that we're consuming resources. So actually, what this goal asks us to do is to think about doing more and better with less and about decoupling economic growth from the impact it has on the environment and on society. And to actually think about if we can get a better model for um, consumption and production, we could actually reduce poverty and transition much better to low carbon and green economies. And then along came this. COVID-19. The reason why I'm not currently in the Netherlands and why um, Martijn had to pivot and for the first time um, operate a hybrid um, Innovate. Now COVID-19 hasn't necessarily changed that transition point, 
but perhaps it's accelerated or accentuated the need for change. And I think perhaps we all enjoyed the fact and could look quite fondly at the fact that um, global emissions significantly reduced during lockdown. And I think there's a call from many to actually think about how we can sustain that. And actually, the United Nations has also recognised this. And even within Sustainability Goal number 12, they've recognised that COVID-19 and our response to it is an opportunity to support a more systematic shift to a more sustainable economy. And actually, what they argue is for us to get this better relationship between um, the economy, people and nature, and that we, all of us, and I think innovators at the core of that with those innovative startups that are approaching the way that we look at supply chains in such different ways that what we must collectively do is find ways to build back better. And so what I'd like to do is share with you three things. Firstly, a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 on supply chains based on one of those surveys that Martin was alluding to. Also to talk about how we can build better supply chain resilience. And again, this is supported by some of our work at WMG. And then last but not least, I'd like us to think about how we can collectively, perhaps using the power of those innovative startups to think about how we can build back better. And so to start with, let's have a little think about the impact of COVID-19, which has affected us all individually and professionally. So we've done a number of surveys this year. Um, the first was in conjunction with Blue Yonder, where we looked at the impact of COVID-19 on um, the retail sector. And then more recently, we actually um, surveyed over 250 manufacturing firms to look at the impact on the manufacturing sector. Um, most of our respondents um, were generally senior managers in mid to large companies. Um, with over 78% being senior management executives and nearly 60% having roles within the supply chain. And what we found is that three months post lockdown, at least 58% of firms were still experiencing some kind of decrease in demand. But on the positive side, nearly three quarters of those firms had been relatively effective in responding to both increases and decreases. And when we look at the strategies that those companies deployed to help navigate that COVID path, interestingly, um, inventory strategy to buffer against disruption was the most favoured response. That was similar in our retail results where it was around 61%. Now, inventory is a great buffer, but it's a great buffer if you saw an increase in demand as a result of COVID. It's perhaps not such a good buffer if your sales were turned off overnight, as we saw in many industries, such as the aerospace and automotive industries. In that case, what you're actually doing is sat on a lot of capital, which isn't helping your cash flow at the time when your business most needs it. However, if you look at the opposite way, and perhaps in which you could have achieved that, which is through the reliance on suppliers with agile production networks, and actually only 32% of organizations were actually adopting that approach. And so perhaps what we're seeing is that we're using a slightly traditional and less agile approach to our buffering inventory, rather than actually thinking more creatively about how we could use a more agile supply network to actually help us reduce that risk. And not surprisingly, the other thing that we saw was um, multi-sourcing and visibility as two other critical responses as they helped organizations who potentially had routes of supply turned off or were concerned that a route to supply might be turned off, trying to find other ways to manage risk across their supply chains. And when we then look at the types of actions that companies took to actually securing um, their supply chains, these were very similar in both retail and in manufacturing. So fundamentally, the first priority for firms was to actually manage their cash. And um, you could see this through um, activations of things like new credit lines, but also you can either see that um, either suppliers payments were postponed, where um, companies perhaps needed to free up cash or were brought forward early, where there was a concern about the cash flow situation within their supply base. 
The second thing that we then saw that actually securing supply was a critical response, which you could see both through arranging alternative suppliers, placing extra orders at suppliers, but also through those early payments. Um, and you could actually argue, I know when we reflected on this at one of my recent supply chains in practice events, that in a way some of these actions, such as creating a product, a product priority plan, accelerating to weekly daily planning cycles, are the sorts of things that you would imagine that good supply chain managers were doing anyway, but perhaps were just highlighted by the COVID crisis. But there is good news out there, and actually particularly in retail, I think um, despite the panic buying and some of the early signs of um, empty shelves, I think the survey that we do with Blue Yonder really did identify that the majority of firms found that their planning systems were effective and that the investment they'd made in those planning systems was well justified but that um, it still required human intervention, particularly in the retail case, for a large percentage of instances. And that's of course because the spike created by COVID was nothing that the machine learning or AI type algorithms had ever seen before. But what I'm suspecting now as we go into a second wave, those systems are beginning to learn and actually the degree of human intervention that may now be required may be reduced. So what does all this mean? Um, what does this mean um, in terms of how we've gone about building supply chain resilience? Well, if we look at what supply chain resilience is, there's three phases to when it's required. There's readiness, which we may do pre-disruption. So for the last two years, I know the UK and um, many other countries across Europe have been perhaps um, preparing for um, what we hoped would be the uninevitable, but increasingly seems to be the inevitable Brexit. You can get the responsiveness, which happens during the disruption, and we've seen this happening within um, COVID. And then you get the um, post-disruption phase where you look for recovery and growth. And fundamentally, these three different phases require slightly different strategies. Um, ahead of an event, we can perhaps proactively start to prepare for it. Um, after an event, we have to be reactive and respond to it. And during an event, we perhaps there's a, a series of... Um, solutions that um, actually combine a number of different practices and supply chain resilience can be seen as really as the capability of the firm to be alert to to adapt to and to quickly respond to the changes brought about by a supply chain disruption and what we've identified is that there's six different supply chain resilience practices that underpin this so in the proactive strategies that we see that are particularly effective are around supply chain planning, particularly around demand forecasting and contingency planning, around creating supply chain visibility, particularly end-to-end -end and having real-time access to data. The strategies that are equally valid either proactively or reactively are around collaboration, um, working with your supply chain partners to understand and deliver customer value around buffer management, which is where you may utilize inventory and production capacity to buffer against uncertainty and to enable flow, and flexibility in the supply base in particular, which is around establishing um, different um, supply network options. And then last but not least, uh, adaptability, which is the ability of a supply chain to be able to transform in response to a dynamic business environment. And so we asked our same 250 manufacturing um, firms a range of different questions that actually assessed their supply chain resilience practices. And if you look at the orange, oops, my screen's a little bit more dynamic than I thought. Um, if you look at the orange line, that is the baseline line. That is um, what supply chain resilience practices the firms felt that they had in place during steady state operations. The purple line on this particular slide is what those organizations felt that their response was in a COVID-19 situation, which is where they had to um, be particularly proactive, uh, sorry, be particularly reactive, because this was obviously something um, that we couldn't necessarily plan for. I think, again, with the Blue Yonder survey, we could see that for retail and to some extent in manufacturing, there was early warnings from China 
um, the disruption was seen first in China, lessons le were learnt in China and then potentially translated over to Europe. But to be fair, everything happened extremely quickly and I would still say that we were predominantly in a reactive situation and still to a greater um, or a lesser extent are. So what we could see here is, um, and again this echoes um, some of those other results, or more COVID specific results, that supply chain planning took a huge step up in terms of both its importance and effectiveness in responding to COVID-19. But in order to do that, it required a higher degree of visibility and collaboration. So dimensions that also saw an increase during COVID-19. But interestingly, and I think this perhaps also echoes or reinforces some of those results that we saw, um, particularly the result where we saw that companies were relying on a buffer management strategy of inventory rather than agile production networks, particularly in their supply base. If you look in the, those cases, the purple line is lagging the orange line. In other words, the situation in COVID was not as effective in steady state and this is where organizations begin to see um, problems. However, slightly uh, on the brighter side, firms therefore um, had to adapt and they showed a great deal of adaptability. And I know in the UK, and I've seen this in other countries across Europe, but in the UK, we were particularly good at adapting to um, perhaps repurposing some of our manufacturing facilities to be able to make additional ventilators and ad additional personal protective equipment. Um, perhaps where we struggled was in some of those more established supply chains like automotive and aerospace, where demand essentially overnight dried up. And some of those organizations had very specific supply chains that produced products in very specific ways and they found it very very difficult to repurpose and if we then look ahead so um, this is quite interesting to compare the supply chain resilience assessment results for brexit so potentially where we're still in a proactive stage what we can see here is that, that, again, supply chain planning, visibility and collaboration are being extensively used to prepare for Brexit. Indeed, um, perhaps the dimension that's being used most of all is that around collaboration, working together. But what we see here is that flexibility has taken an even harder hit. And I think the challenge here is that we just don't know what Brexit is going to look like, whether or not you're the UK or um, based on mainland Europe and therefore these um, it's rather challenging to be able to prepare and flex your supply chain in the right way if we don't actually know what we're preparing for and interestingly at this stage uh, buffer management and adaptability haven't changed um, and I presume this is because they will kick in uh, a slightly um, in a more slightly more reactive way once we know what type of Brexit um, situation supply chains are actually facing. So what I'd now like to share with you is a case study. So Tata Consumer Products have been a long-term collaborator of myself, both when I was at Cranfield School of Management and for the last eight years whilst I've been at WMG. Um, you perhaps would know them in Europe most um, commonly for their Tetley tea brand, but they are actually a um, global organisation. And um, the work we've been doing with Tata Consumer Products has essentially been around how we um, have um, looked at concepts such as um, supply chain segmentation and buffer management to enable them to deliver to their product, to their customers, on time in full, at the lowest possible cost and in a sustainable and responsible way. And interestingly, um, this work, as I said, has been going on for a number of years and it was interesting to see how some of the preparations we put in place, particularly around buffer management, have stood the test of time when COVID-19 began to challenge how Tata consumer products ran their supply chains. And so some of the insights that we've developed over the last five years um, essentially link back to this idea of strategic alignment and that an organization needs to have alignment between its product, its commercial and its supply chain strategy. And one of the things we realized very much working with Tata Consumer Products who um, sell into um, many of the uh, supermarkets essentially 
is that depending on the commercial strategy of the supermarkets, which could either be high-low type promotions, such as buy one, get one free, or buy one, get one half price, or whether or not they're pursuing an everyday low price strategy, those um, different promotional strategies at the retailer um, require a very different buffer management strategy from the supply chain. Because if retailers are pursuing a high-low strategy, that means that actually there's quite a high degree of um, variability in demand, which has to be buffered against. And the most effective way to potentially buffer against that is in spare manufacturing capacity. Whereas if a firm is, if the retailers are operating an everyday low price strategy, then actually the degree of demand variability is relatively low, which potentially enables the buffers across the supply chain to be much, much smaller. But fundamentally, Tata consumer products have to respond to the strategies of their customers. So we would argue that actually, from a supply chain perspective, by far the better way of delivering customer value at lowest possible cost in a sustainable way is an everyday low price strategy. The second thing you need to think about is where do you make, uh, where do you make and where? So this is about decisions such as make or buy, this is about in-country versus nearshoring or offshoring, and also in terms of risk management. And then what both of those potentially lead to is questions about how you segment your supply chain. Um, and we've worked a lot with Tata consumer products about understanding their base level of demand, their surge level of demand, and developing um, differentiated supply chain responses in response, because that then enables you to optimize your supply chain. And so essentially the work we've done is looked at aligning commercial strategy to supply chain strategy. Demand profiling has absolutely been at the core of that and that's enabled us then to inform their buffer management strategy. And the sort of work we've done around demand profiling has enabled them to understand the demand characteristics of each of their products to enable um, um, segmentation. Um, this has not necessarily been using a simple variability to volume because actually with promotions that creates a, an artificially high co coefficient of variation. So we've actually tended to use a model developed by Boyland and Sintintos, which actually uses more of a lumpiness and intermittence of demand. Because once we can profile demand, we know how unpredictable that demand is, and then we can put the right buffer management strategy in place. And the thing that we should never forget is that there's actually two types of buffers. There is both inventory, which is the one that we tend to think about the most, and the pressure here is to reduce that, to reduce working capital in the short term. But actually, spare capacity, particularly spare manufacturing capacity, is also an excellent buffer. You would, I would actually argue that if your retailers are using a high-low uh, promotional strategy, it's actually the best form of um, buffer because... Um, it essentially enables you to, to flex without having that risk of having stock tied up. So if there was a downturn in demand, you're less exposed. However, chief financial officers also often want to run production facilities at very, very high asset utilization because that often maximizes the return on investment. But in reality, that's a slightly false um, calculation because what our research has found time and time again, that if um, you're trying to support a high low promotional strategy, then at best you should tend to be planning your manufacturing assets at around 60% demonstrated capacity. Whereas if you can support um, retailers around an everyday low price strategy where the variability is much lower, you could actually be running with a, um, a demonstrated capacity of around 80-85%. But you have to align your demonstrated capacity to that retailer and commercial strategy. And actually some of the work that we did with Tata Consumer Products then went on to actually try to optimize the supply chain for both inventory and capacity and look at the trade-offs between the two. And this was the supply chain optimization piece where actually we started to look at how we would look at different service levels, how we'd look at the different inventory cover at those different service levels, the different capacity and capital investment that would be required and different shift patterns. And what we could actually begin to see that um, the output was that the output at, for this particular example was around the 60 to 70 percent utilization range but this isn't a fixed number this is something that will change depending on that commercial strategy so this is what we put in place but did it actually make a difference so let's look at coronavirus and the impact that it had on directly competing supply chains 
So um, panic buying caused a huge spike in demand um, around uh, many fast-moving consumer goods, particularly tea, as you can see from this graph. And then um, post-lockdown, um, you could begin to see things beginning to um, level out a bit. And um, this is actually some Nielsen data. Um, the BJWFH is Boris Johnson in the UK announced working from home. But what you can see here is that um, the major brands were actually fighting over a very small percentage share points pre-COVID. And this was very much led by brand and promotional strategy. So you could see the lines pre-Boris um, Johnson work from home are very, very close together. But actually, if you look at the situation post lockdown, you can actually see that there's clear water between those different brands. And we would argue that's a lot to do with the promotional strategies of those different brands, of the supply chain strategies of those different brands. And if you actually look um, from a um, Tata consumer product at how um, their supply chain responded, the blue line is volume sales. And then the red line is actually um, case fill um, for Tata consumer products post COVID. And whilst there was a slight drop off in case fill post COVID, post work from home, um, just at the start of lockdown, much of that was actually agreed with retailers to actually ensure that um, Tata consumer products could actually make some, some make, meet the needs of the NHS and some other priority sectors. But pretty quickly, it returned back to almost 100% case fill. But actually, if you then look at how the supply chain reacted, you could see that equally, um, Tata consumer products were able to flex up manufacturing capacity um, at that point when uh, extra demand was required, and then quite, uh, quite quickly move back to a more normal level of production as things began to stabilize. And what they actually were able to do was to, um, they had within their system about 35% surge capacity which was enabled with production and working 24 seven and weekend working. And as you can see, um, as soon as they hit the 99% plus case fill again, they could return to a normal working practice. And perhaps um, the interesting thing to see here is, um, and again, this is um, data by Asenshal and their online tracking um, for the last 90 days up to the 20th of May, if you actually look at product online availability by T brand at Tesco, Sainsbury's, Asus, Morrison's and Ocado, the performance of Tetley T far outperformed that of its competitors, which I think is absolute testament and empirical evidence that actually by having um, a well thought out supply chain strategy with right sized buffers aligned to commercial strategy can lead to competitive advantage even though you're in a very extreme situation such as post COVID-19. And so what this has essentially demonstrated that Tata consumer products were, enable, were able to develop structural resilience and agility through the correct managing of their buffers. Um, and this worked across both um, raw materials, packaging and finished goods stocks. Um, but Although those starting levels were very clearly identified, they were then able to use those uh, flexibly to adapt during the COVID-19 crisis. But what was absolutely critical here was the fact that they really understood their asset utilization. They really understood the connection between asset utilization and commercial strategy, which provided that instantaneous surge capacity to enable the supply chain to react. And I suppose the lesson to many organizations here, particularly those that are very financially driven, is that that is a very short term gain. And that actually what you need to be able to do is to understand your asset strategy much, much better to know how you can actually use those to create competitive advantage. And so just to wrap up three ways in which I think we can build back better. And there's, this is essentially three questions, which I'm now going to um, go through in turn. The first question, and this is particularly in terms of supply chain network design, we need to work out what we should make, what we should manufacture and where. And actually, I don't necessarily agree. There's been a lot said in the UK at the moment about is this going to see a, a huge 
shift back to right shoring? Do we need to make everything back in the UK? And I'm sure many of your countries are thinking something similar. At the end of the day, we work in a global world and we have many uh, nations across the world to make sure that they have a sustainable future. What is really important is that as we design our supply chains, we do so on the principles of right shoring, which means we put all the right components of a supply chain, whether they be a factory, whether they be a machine, whether they be a distribution center, we make sure we put them in the right place. And that could be a global asset, it might be a regional asset, and in actual fact, many supply chains are regionally based. It could be a local asset, or increasingly, as we move to things like 3D printing, it could actually be an asset that's much more personal and within the home. But what I would argue, um, and this is perhaps where there is a link between national um, strategy and company strategy, is that countries should strive to be self-sufficient in the manufacture of products that are critical to life. Um, and these are things such as food, healthcare, energy, defense, housing and communications. But also, if you're in an individual firm, particularly if you're at the lower tiers within a supply chain, you need to make sure that part of your portfolio is focused on making those products that are critical to life to ensure that you have a resilient base to your um, operations should a crisis hit. Because what we've seen in sectors, again, I'll come back to aerospace and automotive, where we have either got the firms themselves or their supply chains just locked into one sector, they are the industries that have potentially really struggled um, as COVID has hit. And whilst we don't know what the future disruptions are going to be, there is no doubt that we will see future disruptions. And definitely one of the ways to protect your firm, and I hope that all of the Innovate start startups think of this too, is to make sure that you don't have to um, use an English adage, all your eggs in one basket, that you actually spread the risk, both in terms of your customers um, and the sectors in terms of which your customers operate. The second thing that I think is really, really important, and we've seen a lot of evidence that actually China are very, very heavily investing in infrastructure. I think there are two critical infrastructures that are going to revolutionize how we think about manufacturing in, in the future. And again, I hope that innovate type of startups will be able to support this transition. One is around low carbon energy, because if we're going to meet any net zero uh, by 2050 targets, we are going to have to find different ways of producing energy. But the second is around the infrastructure that we require for connectivity. And the reason that I say this is, at the moment, our manufacturing networks tend to be dominated by large factories. But in the future, and I'm going to quote um, Paul Clark, who's the Chief Technology Officer for Ocado, who has a vision of an internet of atoms. And this very play, much plays into a startup or micro SME type of environment. Because imagine that the future isn't about big factories, but actually the future is about these internet of atoms where an atom is an individual machine or an individual micro scooter or van or lorry. And that actually our manufacturing networks of the future um, are dynamically formed into response uh, to demand based on connecting together those individual um, entities, those machines and those ways of moving things. Because the, a future of distributed manufacturing supply chains is really socially levelling. It's both socially levelling across countries, it's socially levelling against large companies and small companies, and it's both socially levelling within regions within an individual country. Because imagine a future where the unit of production is a machine, not a factory, where you compete by being able to do many things through economies of scope, not just by being able to do one thing well where products could be customized if required and produced in a batch size of one, where assets can be fully dispersed and they don't need to be centralized. But in order to do this, we can't think about manufacturing and logistic networks separately. They have to be highly integrated and we need very, very high visibility of the impact both socially and environmentally to drive consumers to make the right choices and support those supply chains that better balance economic, social and environmental trade-offs. And last but not least, we have to think about how we design our supply chains for a more circular economy. We can't continue to make things as cheaply as possible so that we, um, when they break, we can't actually repair them and have to throw them away. We actually have to think about how we perhaps move away from even owning things to support principles such as the sharing economy or servitization, uh, lease models or pay 
as you go type models um, that actually enable us to get more out of the resources. And we need to think much more about how we can maintain things, how we can reuse or redistribute them, how we can refurbish and remanufacture. And actually, we only recycle if we absolutely have to, because recycling is also quite energy intensive. And as we design for a more circular economy, this will actually drive a different supply chain network design. It will better support that distributed manufacturing network, and it will mean that certain aspects of the supply chain will need to be done more locally, so that we do have the, um, the ability within each country to be able to support um, these more circular supply chains. And the other thing that we actually need to think about at the moment, um, we have limited resources still left in the ground, but I, I challenge each and every one of you, um, maybe, after Laura, maybe after Laura and the results um, later on this afternoon, go away and have a look around your house and just look at all the material that you have in there that is currently personal inventory that is doing nothing. And just think about all of that material that you could liberate that could go on to do good because fundamentally we have materials everywhere and if we can learn how to mine within the materials that are already in circulation, we might have to take less material in the future out of the ground. And so to conclude, we started by perhaps thinking um, in a very direct way about the impact that COVID-19 has had on our manufacturing supply chains and also on our retail supply chains. Um, and then reflecting on that, we've thought about the ways that we can leverage those six um, supply chain practices to proactively and reactively respond. And last but not least, we've thought about those three ways in which I, I would employ all of you to actually think about how we can build back better. Um, I'm not sure um, whether or not you have ever seen the film The Matrix, but within it, um, um, Neo is actually asked one of the key characters to make a choice. The blue pill in essence is a way that we carry on in comfortable ignorance and the red pill is to see the truth of life in the present. And you could argue, um, coming back to Sean, coming back to Sean's transition points, blue is the business models of consumption and production pre-COVID-19. Red is now and the future. I would encourage all of you to work with the innovative companies, um, those startups that you've seen through Innovate and with other parts of your supply chain networks to think collectively how you will build back better. Thank you. And maybe you can uh, uh, put up your screen so we can see you. Uh, we have some questions and remarks. Um, so I know in the Netherlands we have uh, Emma Shoes. Um, they make uh, industrial boots and you can't uh, uh, buy them, you, you rent them out, and after a year they will recollect them and they uh, will uh, make new ones out of it. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing, um, and then I'll get to the, to the questions. Uh, last year's winner of our Innovate uh, Startup Contest was uh, Circular IQ, and they create a product passport and they have already applied for office furniture. So the Dutch governments are demanding an office of a, a, a product passport Actually, it's the, the bill of material with all the uh, uh, suppliers involved. So you have a, an open bill of material, so you know where all the, the, the parts from the office furniture is coming from. So that's uh, the government asking for it. Shouldn't companies also ask for a product passport for all the suppliers? And how can we arrange that? Um, I would fully agree, Martijn. And I think this is where supply chain visibility perhaps takes on a different dimension. Um, I had a vision, I, I sat next to someone on a plane once who worked at Body Shop and the Body Shop have perfect products um, in that they all have a really good brand story behind them. But the person from Body Shop was saying to me that actually consumers, it's really, really hard to tell the consumers all the stories behind the products. And I can soon see a future where you'd go into the Body Shop, scan two different um, QR codes and the stories behind those products will become visible and that will be the basis upon which consumers can start to make a choice. I, I had an interview of the, with the COO of Lego, Karsten Rasmussen, uh, last year. I was in uh, Bilut, uh, Denmark, and he was looking for other manufacturing companies to, uh, who are in need of similar plastics products. 
So uh, I said to them, you know, go talk to HPE because they have a lot of keyboards. Uh, they don't uh, uh, don't know what to do with it. So there's a need for volume, and I think you know, industry should look to other industries to find this 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 uh, this volume. So what is your recommendation uh, in that area? Yes, so um, I think it comes into the sort of mining for materials concept. I think we all need to think much more about the value that's inherent within the products that we finish with and be much more creative about thinking about ways in which we can give those products back. So some of the simpler ways of doing that, so if you think about HP Instant Ink, I think I may have mentioned them last year, um, it's a really good business model because um, not only is it a pay-per-go model, so you pay for the ink that, you, well, they guarantee you never run out of ink, but actually the business model encourages you to give the cartridges back. So it closes the loop. Yeah, and I think there is also a role for the suppliers who are selling out to Lego uh, raw materials and to HPE for their uh, keyboards, that those uh, suppliers should uh, uh, ask for the returns of the material or have a coordinating role. So they could create a business model on top of that. Yeah, but the problem here often, Martin, isn't the companies, it's the consumers. So if you look at things even like battery recycling, actually, um, I think if most of us looked around our homes, we'd be a bit embarrassed to find little piles of batteries all over the place that we've not necessarily given back to be recycled. And so I think we need to find a way to um, get consumers to engage. Also, consumers aren't necessarily willing at the moment to pay um, a premium of the price in terms of more ethically sourced products. Um, if you just think about something like coffee, where there's a fair trademark, not everybody necessarily buys fair trade coffee, though they could. And then in the Netherlands, they're going to introduce, uh, you know, e extra payments for, by the consumers for aluminium cans. So is that the way forward, that uh, you have to pay extra and you get the, your turns when you will uh, put them in? At the restore, at retail? I don't know. In the UK, we have just um, been given an award for a, a, a new circular economy centre called Circular Metals, and actually one of the materials we'll be looking at is aluminium. We're actually far better at looking at the recycling of aluminium than we are, for instance, steel. So I think there's huge opportunities around steel. And I think there's um, many projects that are currently out there to look at how by 2050 we could only be using steel that's already in circulation rather than um, having to continue to um, mine for iron ore and coal. Um, another question from the audience is, you know, um, you talked about uh, network design and new, new ways of uh, d uh, designing your network and look beyond it. And now we see in technology area the rise of digital twins uh, also to put in your suppliers and uh, uh, retailers and contact manufacturers. So what I, do you think of the role, the possible role of the use of digital twin to redesign a global supply chain? I, I think digital twins um, are definitely the way forward. If you think about them, many organizations have had them, but they're static, where they use um, network design software to actually create um, static models of the future and, and I think the digital twin bit is then making them so they're real time and live. What I would hope is that as we design those digital twins that we look not only at cost and the flow of material and the flow of cash, so the three traditional supply chain flows, but we also start to also monitor the flow of carbon. And so if you think of it, carbon's the fourth and hidden supply chain dimension so we could start to measure cash, material, information, and carbon. Uh, we're almost uh, out of time, so uh, I'm going to wrap up. There was one question, you know, you talked about uh, buffer management, so uh, inventory as buffer and capacity as bu buffer. So what is the role of time, lead time as buffer? So lead time affects the size of those buffers too. So there's something called the lead time gap, and depending on... Um, the, the, time to, uh, the time to supply versus um, your production time, then you would, that, that will affect the size of your buffer as well. Okay, right. Um, so we have one minute, so uh, thank you uh, for, for joining again. Uh, it was uh, nice to have you here, although it was online, but uh, nonetheless, uh, an exciting uh, presentation. 
Uh, thank you, and uh, we go on next to Laura, and uh, we will see what uh, uh, the best performing supply chains are doing and what the role of supply chain planning uh, is uh, in all this. Thank you, Janet, and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Bye.